begin with our class here. Uh, before we do, uh, Sai, could you pray for us? Sure. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gospel that we just heard preached to us, for the service of worship. And Lord, as we come together now to consider uh, uh, the truth of your word once again, as we can, uh, this important topic, Lord, that not only relates to the future, but uh, profoundly impacts the present. Uh, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to understanding, and that you would uh, give Josh your blessing and wisdom as he teaches. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, uh, welcome to uh, the beginning of this uh, eight-part series, eight classes. Uh, we're calling All Things New. This is an introduction class to Reformed eschatology. Uh, this first class I've called, uh, I left dispensationalism behind. Now what? Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about that title and why it's called that, um, and maybe what the reference is, if you know what the reference is. Um, I'll take over now. <laughs> okay. Oh, with the microphone. Great. Okay. Um, so we're going to be looking at Reformed eschatology. Uh, and if you saw the either the, um, the I think it was pinned up on the in the hallway, also the uh, the little half sheet that was in the bulletin. And if you read through it, you kind of get a sense of what Russell and I are, are shooting for, what we'd like to accomplish in these eight weeks. Um, this topic is enormously huge. It's an enormous topic. So to try to talk about eschatology in eight weeks is insurmountable. We're not going to do everything. It's kind of like, uh, who knows what just the basic uh, idea of what is eschatology mean? What is that a reference to? The end times. End, end times are the, the last days, the last things, right? The last. So it's a chronological reference, right? So second coming of Christ, resurrection, the judgment, uh, the, the famous millennium question, all those kinds of things are often they're under this uh, category of eschatology, right? So we're going to be using the word eschatology, eschatological. It's not trying to be fancy or tricky. It's just, it's a big word. It just means uh, last things. However, we're not only talking about a couple of years before the return of Christ. Because what we're going to be arguing uh, a little bit today, this is just an introduction class, but in a few weeks, uh, we're going to be talking about how all of Scripture is eschatological. All of Scripture is leading to last things. Last things, right? You're reading a book. The last chapter has a lot of chapters before it. And if you just picked up the last chapter and sat down to read it, you would have no idea what is going on. You'd be totally lost. So it's essential to understand all the things that come before it. What are all the things that come first and second? How, what, what's going on? What's the big picture of this? Uh, so that's what we're going to be thinking about and trying to do. This is building off of, intentionally building off of the covenant theology class that we just had. Uh, Russell and Sai led through that. So we've talked about the nature of the covenant and God's people throughout history. And this is now continuing that idea, right? So if you missed that class, we're not going to be talking about the difference between dispensationalism and covenant theology. We're, we're assuming that we built off that. Now we're going to the next step. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, how many of you here have had an eschatology Sunday school class or sermon series that you have sat under or participated in. How many of you? Just curious. Ten, ten or so. Um, what was the background? What was the viewpoint? I'm just curious. Is this from a while back, is it in a reform context? Because we're talking about reformed eschatology, so it's relevant to ask. I'm just curious. Mine was Ken Johnson when I was a teenager, so it's definitely reformed. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, we did it in uh, the oldest group. Um, oldest group. Okay. So, again, reform context. Do we have um, any anyone in here from uh, a dispensational background and kind of be operating, thinking about that? in the background of a lot of these discussions? Okay. It's good to know because some of these things, you know, it's hard. I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit, but I came from a dispensational background. So when, there's some, there, when there are things that are talked about in the Reformed world, um, there are a lot of things that are understood with covenant theology. And in my mind, I have, I'm remembering all these other discussions. So it's good to know um, where everybody's coming from. Um, so this uh, is an enormous topic, as I said. Uh, we will not have time, therefore, 
to dig into the weeds of exegetical questions and this one particular verse and this prophetic comment, right? We have eight weeks to go over the breadth of eschatology. Um, However, this is a a highly enjoyable topic, and I would love to talk with you about it. So if you do have a question like that, I'm I'm an open book. I'm, I'm happy to talk. I maybe don't have the answer. But at least I could say, well, I'd look in this book or try this or ask Russell. <laughs> so um, I want you to know that. Uh, you might feel, if you, are, if you are very interested in this and you have a lot of really specific questions, you're going to feel disappointed because it's so big. Uh, but if you do have questions, don't feel disappointed because we're available to, to talk. Um, so our goal with this, with this series is to provide a map, a lay of the land. Um, and the reason that is is because... Um, in our given context, in the uh, American 21st century context, in Christian circles, you may be at work working with another Christian, and you might hear some comment about the end times or some comment about uh, a news event, a war that's unfolding. And there might be something that's said, and you don't really even know what to say about it, maybe. You say, Ooh, what would my church say about that? I'm just curious. I don't even know. I don't know what to say to that. I don't have a, a framework to think about that. One quick example of what I'm trying to talk about. I'll say this. So I'm a, I'm a woodworker, right? So if I said to you, it is much more efficient to be planing your stock against a bench hook as opposed to fixing the stock in a tail vise because you can adjust your, your stock throughout the whole process, you have no context to understand if what I said is true or not, right? It's only when you understand what a workbench is, a bench hook and planing, and okay, then you can say, that's bogus. I'm a tail vice guy, <laughs> right? And we should talk if you do. Um, but so that's what I, that's kind of a little tiny silly picture of what I'm talking about. You'll hear something thrown out maybe. And if you don't have a clear big picture, you don't even know what to think about that. Is that true? Is this unfolding before our eyes? Is this, I, don't, I don't even know what to think about that. So our goal is to provide a map, a lay of the land, so that we can begin to have this framework. Uh, also... Uh, With that, it's important then to clarify what I and and we, Russell and I, are meaning by reformed. Um, And it's it's important just because we're defining reformed as the standard reform confessions. The Westminster Confession of Faith, the Heidelberg Catechism, Canons of Dort, basic reform confessions. And it's important to clarify that just because um, I think many of us are aware of There are a a good number of Christians from other uh, ecclesiastical backgrounds, other sorts of churches, who have discovered TULIP, you know, the five points of Calvinism, and have adopted them and embraced them as the the grace of the gospel, and have put them on top of their their system of reading scripture. And so some people say, oh yeah, I'm reformed. And then there's this whole different paradigm of looking at scripture. So I'm not, this is not a disparaging comment. It's a clarifying comment. When we're talking about Reformed, what we're talking about is the Reformed confessions. Um, so again, not to disparage, but just to be clear, you know, like John MacArthur and you know, a Calvinistic dispensationalism, that kind of thing. In this class, we're excluding Calvinistic dispensationalism or other sorts of hybrid views. Okay? So we're going to be talking about the Reformers. What would John Calvin say about that comment you heard at the water cooler? <laughs> Just curious. I would love to know what he had to say. Or the Puritans or the, uh, the Westminster Divines who wrote the Confession. Those are the kinds of things we're going to focus on in this class. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, I came from a dispensational background. And uh, this is not a class or even uh, this particular class is not about me and my journey. It's just a little bit of window into the, the kind of logical steps you have to go through to, to figure out eschatology, right? And I'll show you what I mean. When I became a Christian when I was 17 years old, it was within a dispensational context. So I didn't, I didn't know anything about the Bible, and people were saying, the Bible's the Word of God, and this is what it says, and I said, okay, great. And that was what I was uh, discipled with. Um, and so that what ended up happening in the particular circles that I was a part of um, in the Sunday sermons and every Bible study, it seemed like there was a strong fixation on finding Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in the newsreel. That was a, a very common theme that I experienced. Um, and so what I want to do, uh, I don't know if you've listened to any uh, you know, or looked at reform resources, but I want to, at the outset, just caution us 
Um, and note that we're not casting aspersions on our brothers and sisters of this persuasion. It's not godly. It's not edifying. It's not helpful for what we're trying to do right now. Uh, but it's just a reality of what I experienced. It's a very different kind of context. So um, I will very briefly just remind us of what kind of thing is uh, present in our culture, um, just to remind us of what other people kind of think about this. So um, we've all heard about failures of end times forecasts. Um, if you've heard of the book, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988, didn't happen. So the sequel in 89 was called uh, The Final Shout. Um, that you also may remember Harold Camping. Uh, he predicted a secret rapture at 6 p.m. May 21st, 2011. That got bumped to October when it didn't happen. Um, and he actually later, interestingly, he actually later described his predictions of that. I, I, wouldn't, I don't know that I would use this word necessarily. I'd have to think about it. But he described that he repented of those predictions, and he actually described them as sinful. He so you know, before we you know throw stones at someone, it's just, it's important to see he was struggling to try to understand and realized I am approaching this the totally wrong way. Um, so some people um, this is you know this can be embarrassing, of course, to people who have made the predictions. Uh, some people in the church are embarrassed for the church when this happens. When the New York Times says again it didn't happen, right? So there's this kind of awkwardness that comes with eschatology discussions. So we might think that these kinds of predictions are a uniquely modern thing, that, oh yeah, that's this 20th, 21st century thing that people do. It's actually not the case. It's been happening all throughout church history. This is a really common pervasive thing. And it's because often what happens is we see that this is not it. What we see around us, we see the corruption and we think, this is the worst it has ever been, and there's no possible way that this could go on any longer. These must be the last days. I mean, look around us. Every single generation says that, every single one. And it's not to say things are not bad around us. It's to say, when, if you're using that as a framework, say, I've looked out. I talked to my coworker. Clearly, Jesus is coming back in like 10 minutes because it's, that conversation went so south. That is what Christians, uh, some Christians have been doing throughout every generation. Um, and as Mickey reminded us at the marriage conference, he said, you think the 21st century is bad. Would you like to swap places with Christians in the first century? Raise your hand if you'd like to swap places. Or the 5th century, or the 10th century, okay, right? So it's just a caution. To be, it's, a, it's a hermeneutical thing. If you say, because it's so bad, therefore I know that Jesus is coming back soon, you now see the, the error with that. <coughs> Um, the Donatists in the second century did this. The Millerites in 1843 and then 1844. And dispensationalism, which was developed in the 1830s, is, is especially known for this. So as tempting as it might be to talk about those things and to kind of, and even some of the reformers and some people made claims about what they saw unfolding before their eyes, right? This looking at Isaiah right here, this is what happened last week at the meeting, you know? Um, as tempting as it might be to, to talk about things, the focus of our whole class from now on forward to the end of these eight weeks is to do a constructive theology, to talk about how do we understand, how do we even assess or think about these questions. Um, in response to, to some of this uh, end time prediction that doesn't uh, transpire, uh, it's quite common in, I'd, I'd guess, in reform circles, but in other circles who are not um, inclined to talk about that, that there's a common joke, and you've all heard it probably, that they're not all millennial or premillennial or postmillennial, but they're panmillennial. What's panmillennial? It's all going to pan out at the end. <laughs> so, so what is that saying? What are they saying? They're saying, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. And it's joking and lighthearted, and that's fine. But that's not quite quite the spirit in which the scriptures call us to think about God's word, right? Uh, we don't want to say, well, by the, the eschatology is trivial, if that's what someone means by saying that. Uh, we don't want to think that way. Uh, it doesn't quite take scripture seriously enough, and we may differ, but it's not irrelevant or trivial. So uh, as, as part of my story, coming into the Reformed faith, um, I didn't see, I, I, so I came from hearing about 
eschatology every single sermon virtually, you know, I'm not exaggerating, it was very, very, very common, to come into the reform world, and I didn't hear anything detailed about that stuff at all. And I thought, what do these people believe? I didn't know. And so talking with Russell and reading books and trying to understand, it took me a while to kind of figure out what this is. And so um, not many people in you know, reform context that I've experienced sit around the dinner table talking about eschatology. It's not something that's a, it's a prominent conversation. So I, you know, I, I naively thought at first, oh, maybe these people are all pan millennial. They don't know what to think, right? Or I don't, they don't, they're, they're not concerned with it or something. Uh, so I started digging and doing some reading. saying, what do reform people say to these questions? This, this theology that I'm coming in with, how, what would they respond to that? I'm just curious. And I actually was really surprised. There was a ton that was said about this. It's a huge discussion. It always has been in reform's uh, history. So that's why we, there's no way eight weeks will cover it because reformers thought deeply about these things uh, and were not uh, indifferent to it. So I'm suspicious that some of our indifference might be a reaction to the Left Behind series or a reaction to the last day's crazed madness that we say, no, 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 we're not like that. But what, we, what that ends up happening is we say, well, we'll leave eschatology to the dispensationalists and we'll just say, we'll just see how it pans out. We can do better than that. And the reformers did. They did an excellent job. So we're going to be thinking about uh, those, uh, this topic through that kind of way of thinking. Um, so the Bible is, as I said, is thoroughly eschatological. It's not just the bits at the end or something, right? It's all the way through scripture. And it's tethered to ethics, Eschatology is not to satisfy our curiosity. When God reveals things to us, it's not because it's curious or interesting, right? It's not like a crossword puzzle. It's to drive us to ethics, to drive us to godly living, to drive us to hope, to drive us to labor in the Lord because we know that it is not in vain, right? As 1 Corinthians 15, what's 1 Corinthians 15 all about? What's the subject of that chapter? It's kind of a famous chapter that ends with, Death, where is your sting? <coughs> Come on, someone. Resurrection. The resurrection, right? The resurrection of the dead. And it ends, let's see, yeah, I do have it right here. It ends. The whole chapter is about the resurrection. And after that, it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is what's going to happen. Therefore, live godly. Love your neighbor. Therefore, be steadfast, right? And so that is the way scripture uh, consistently applies this. It's not just for curiosity, but it's for living. So um, uh, one way you could kind of summarize so many of these examples in scripture, uh, you know, the apostles, if you were to kind of condense it all, uh, often the way this functions, it's, it's, it's as if the apostles are saying, keep the faith vindication is coming. This is your future. Now live like it. Live in the light of what God has promised in his word. And so that is, uh, we can't separate ethics from eschatology. And we can't separate eschatology from questions of covenant theology and dispensationalism. So that it's, that's why we're building off of the covenant theology class because we can't start with the last chapter and make any sense of how do I even th- who are these characters? What, what happened here? What were the dynamics? So to, to illustrate this, um, who knows what the fundamentalist modernist controversy was? Sai, could you give a you know, two sentence just what was the point? What was the... Well, in, in the 20s and 30s, there's a lot of modernism was kind of creeping over from higher criticism in Germany. It's making its way over to America. And there was a lot of uh, questioning and, and, um, and doubting the fundamentals, quote unquote, of faith. Yeah. Um, the virgin birth of Christ, the inerrancy of scripture. And a lot of uh, theologians uh, produced a 12 volume set called The Fundamentals with a lot of reputable theologians that wrote essays against these things. And then the, the word fundamentalist came out of that. But it was basically arguing for the fundamental doctrines, quote unquote, of the Christian faith. Yeah. Thank you. There's a lot of commas in those two sentences. (laughs) (laughs) 
It was Pauline, yeah, exactly. Um, so that was a great summary. Uh, uh, liberalism was compromising. It was, it was challenging, I should say, challenging the integrity of the word of God. And uh, many Christians, faithful, conservative Christians, rose up and said, uh-uh, with a lot of responses. And what happened historically as it unfolded, many of them, I don't know if you could say most, but at least, at least many of them, the most vocal and prolific were coming from dispensationalist background or dispensationalist uh, frameworks of thinking. And what ended up happening in The Fundamentals, this, this uh, publication, uh, is that dispensationalism was placed alongside the virgin birth and the inerrancy of scripture and dispensationalism. And all, all right, so whoa, wait a second here, right? Um, and so who knows who Jay Gresham Machen is? Okay. So Machen was the, the founder of the OP, or denomination, and at this time, he was, con- he was in the midst of all this, and you had these liberals who were saying all this stuff, and you had these, this particular group of fundamentalists who were aligning dispensationalism with the integrity of Scripture, and he's not a dispensationalist, but he's certainly not a liberal. Uh, he wrote a book called Christianity and Liberalism. Liberalism is another religion. It's not a Christian religion. That's the foundation of our denomination, that, that vision saying, leaving mainline Presbyterianism, liberalism, and saying, no, we believe the gospel like the confession does. So, not liberal at all by any slight imagine of your imagination, and certainly not dispensational. So there's this straddling place, oh, where do I fit in this, this culture war, right? And so I say that because that, that's, where our denomination is coming, coming from, and it's not uniquely our denomination, it's what the confessions, the Reformed confessions are coming from. So when, when, what happens is when I was uh, converted into dispensationalism from being a non-Christian to these circles, in my mind, what they told me is virgin birth, inerrancy, dispensationalism, right? So... Um, what I, uh, let's see, who knows what a, a paradigm shift is? Or where, I'll say this, who knows where we got that phrase from? Who came up with that phrase? What's the, the background to that? Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn, exactly. And so Thomas Kuhn uh, in the, uh, was a 20th, a 20th century philosopher of science. Um, and what he was, maybe you recognize this. There was a view of science at that time. And it was this that everybody is a neutral observer, and what's, what's going on with scientific progress is that you just accumulate facts. It's just a steady, linear pro- uh, progress, and we're all accumulating facts, and we slowly grow in our understanding, and that explains scientific progress. Kuhn is a philosopher of science and said, uh-uh, that is never how it works, or uh, rarely how it works, I'll say. The leaps in scientific progress are through what he described as paradigm shifts, so here's how it works, right? And I, uh, he said, to, un- to, to believe that humans are totally neutral, just passively receiving information without any uh, framework or ideology or paradigm is naive. So what happens is there's a scientific consensus. Again, I'm just, that he's looking at scientific uh, consensus. And he was saying, there's this consensus. There are certain things that are plausible, and certain things that are not plausible, right? And so you'll have these dissenters raising up saying, uh, excuse me, I've been doing some studies and this is showing this. And they say, quiet, quiet, quiet. That's unorthodox, right? And then another person, then another person. And what happens through all of these developments is that more and more crisis moments happen. More and more people raise up and say, excuse me, this doesn't fit the paradigm. And when it, what happens is enough of that comes up and then this, there's this consensus changes and they go, whoa, these facts that we can't, that are incontestable don't fit the paradigm. So they change the paradigm. They ha- have a better, broader framework. So there are these leaps, right? That's what, when we've heard that phrase, paradigm shift. Oh, such a paradigm shift. We got that from Thomas Kuhn. And many people in all these different areas of life have applied that because that's exactly what happens with us. So when I left dispensationalism behind, I had a paradigm shift. If you've had that kind of experience, it's exciting, 
new understanding. Oh, wow, you see, oh, this is everywhere. How come I didn't see this, right? Have you had that experience with anything? Um, but at the same time, it's really unsettling because you don't have a clear picture of the paradigm. You're saying, ah, whoa, I, I don't know how to make sense of this. And so um, what I realized at that time, coming out of that background, I realized that what the Reformed faith understands about this Israel and the church question or series of questions is fundamental to all these questions. It is the foundation of trying to understand what to make of end times statements. And you can't jump to the last chapter and skip over all of the discussion about the history of redemption, what God's doing through his covenant people and the nature of Christ coming and preaching. You you have to understand how that works. So, um, I want to talk about that in this first, um, this first class. Uh, this is not just recapping the covenant theology class, but it's with a specific aim to clarify our thinking about the questions of Israel and the church because as we go forward, that's going to be the, the foundation, the theological foundation to be able to even assess Revelation chapter 17 or, or something, you know, right? Any given question. Um, so we're going to think about this together. Any questions before I proceed with, with this topic? Okay. So uh, I will also say what we're going to do is look at uh, several different passages. Um, you have them listed there for you. Uh, some of them I put the full text. Some of them I just referenced. Um, you are more than welcome to, to race, to turn to the page. But also it's very about sometimes when there are too many scriptures read, it's distracting to try to jump, 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 jump. So when we, when we hear God's word preached, there's value in just hearing it. So it's okay. Don't feel like I have to go look this up to make sure that he's not reading something wrong, right? You have the references. You can look them up. But feel free to hear. Just listen to the way that scripture talks. So the first place, uh, what I want to point out is that in Jeremiah 31, the prophecy of the new covenant, the new covenant is made with whom? Do you remember? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So the question is, are you in the new covenant? Do you take the Lord's Supper? Because that's the sign of the covenant, right? Okay? Interesting. Jesus came to his own people in John 1. He came to his own people, and when and Paul, we just heard preach this morning that the gospel went to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jew first, also to the Greek. And what was the pattern in Acts? When the apostles went to a new city, what did they do? Where'd they go? Synagogue. Synagogue. Why? Because the Jews first, right? This is the promise. This is the Jewish Messiah. Right? This is just the way it, it was designed to unfold. Um, God called Abraham and his seed and this whole, and Jesus came to be their Messiah and this is unfolding, right? So we remember all of these stories about Jesus interacting with the religious leaders of his day. So much of the gospels are filled with this tension and you could think of it as political tension. It's, pow- it's a power struggle or maybe it's the elite, you know, the elite people and the carpenters, you know, or what is it, right? <laughs> Or it's the hypocrites and the true believers, or you could try to understand the relationship. But what I want to do is walk through, Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. So we're going to look at these scriptures. Uh, And many, 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 many of the parables are about this exact subject. So let's look at a few. Matthew 21, uh, you're welcome to turn there, uh, starting in verse 3. I'll just read it, though, and I'll read to the end of the chapter. So Jesus, parables, religious leaders in his day, the the Jewish leaders of his day, he's always in disagreements with them. And here's a parable he says. They're listening, by the way. They're there listening, and you'll see that in this text. Jesus said, hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower, uh, built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. 
Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore, he says to the crowd, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their season. That's justice, right? They say, and Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Do you catch that? Jesus is saying, you killed the son, the one who said you'd listen, And therefore, they said, give it to others. That's what they said. And Jesus said, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be in the kingdom, and it'll be taken from you, right? Okay, that's the first one. Um, The faith of the centurion. Centurion uh, called this this Gentile saying, Lord, my servant is ill. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 8. Lord, my servant's ill. Just say the word, and he'll be healed. And Jesus responds to him, truly, I tell you, no one in his, uh, with no one in Israel, Have I found such faith? I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this, as you're recognizing this and you're saying, oh yeah, this is a theme. Jesus is not only a priest and king, but he's the prophet who comes to declare this wicked and adulterous generation seeks a sign, right? And how many times do you remember, if, if you, you do your you know, yearly Bible reading, you're going through, you're going through the Gospels again, how many times does Jesus speak to this generation, X, Y, Z, this faithless generation, this wicked, adulterous generation? It's a theme, and he's always in conflict uh, with the leaders of his day. So if, you're not, if they're not coming back to your memory, uh, do a quick word search uh, this afternoon. Uh, look up in the Gospels. Look, generation. And you'll see Jesus comments. His, his characterization of the generation in which he was sent. That generation of people, he's speaking to them, saying, this is how I understand that, uh, the way you're treating me. Um, I will uh, skip down to one more of these. He says... Um, I'll give you one example. This is uh, Luke 13. And so many of these, these situations, we can apply these stories in so many different personal ways. Um, but as I'm, as I'm highlighting, if you go through these parables and you look through them and you see the conflict, you'll see this theme very, very pervasive. Jesus is chastising this adulterous generation, right? So Luke 13, starting in verse 24. Listen to what the Lord is, is saying here. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence. And you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, Some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. To the Jew first, 
and also to the Greek, right? So Jesus is telling this adulterous generation, if you were truly Abraham's son, you would have rejoiced to see my day. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You were of your father, the devil. This generation, what are you doing? Have you not seen? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, right? And so what's interesting about this is Jesus condemns the generation. You remember what he said? He says, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. And what does he say about Sodom and Gomorrah and Tyre and Sidon? At the day of judgment, what are they going to say to that particular generation? They're going to say, guys, Sodom and Gomorrah is going to say, whoa, guys, Jesus was in your streets. Are you crazy? That's a paraphrase, by the way. (laughs) Okay, so, whoa, 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 okay. What is that, replacement theology? What is that? Jesus is condemning that generation, and he's saying, cast out. East and the West, Gentiles are going to flood in, cast out, given to others is what the, those, that was the wording of the religious leaders, right? Um, so replacement theology, uh, I could be mistaken, but I, I don't believe there is anybody who actually adopts that as their descriptor. No one would say, yes, I'm a replacement theologian. I believe in replacement theology. As I understand it, uh, I hope, I hope that's just a pejorative made up. It's, it's a mischaracterization of what I've read, what the Reformed Confessions uh, present about covenant theology. Uh, it's not replacement theology uh, because, and we'll get into this a little bit here, that whole idea of saying there was this one people group who had some stuff, but then there's this other people group who that was taken away from and given to that people group. That's not what Reformed theology teaches at all. That's not it. And if, and if that is what you thought, let's clarify that, and we'll, we'll get to the clarification on that. It's not replacement, two different groups. It's engrafting. And so we're going to look at that in just a minute. Um, so it is important to point out, to say at this point, uh, perhaps some of us feel uncomfortable um, when we start talking about God covenantally um, judging the Jews of Jesus' day, it starts sounding like, is this anti-Semitic? And anti-Semitism throughout the church has existed, right? And it's a misunderstanding, I think, of these passages. Uh, But also, post-Holocaust, theology, some theology, has been completely shaped by this response to this historic event. So we need to acknowledge that, um, but we can't change the scriptures. Jesus said, this wicked and adulterous generation. So, Here's what's critical. Here's what's critical. Here's why it's not replacement theology, and it's not anti-Semitic at all. Did Jesus hate Jews? <laughs> I mean, right? Okay, we're, we're gent. Many of us, I, I think, are Gentiles here. We're following our Lord, so this is what Jesus was saying. Okay, so we're trying to understand that and embrace it. So here's what's critical. Jesus' condemnation of these people was not against the people of his own race or ethnicity. It's not racist. Jesus' condemnation was against that specific generation, right? So you remember the prophets, they do, Jesus came as the prophet and he took on all this prophetic language. And this is consistent with the way that the prophets speak, saying, you know, you're just filling up the, the sins of your fathers. You're just like in, the, in the saying, this generation, you guys are way off the rails. Therefore, God's going to judge you. And the next generation comes up and maybe they walk in righteousness and they're blessed. And then they go into idolatry and he says, okay, this generation, wicked, right? And judgment comes. That's, that's the back and forth. You've read the Old Testament, you know, that's the cycle, right? Um, so this is exactly what's going on here at, in Jesus' ministry as well. So let's look at um, one, one, uh, how this unfolds. Um, in Matthew 23, listen to this. So Jesus is... Um, leading, he's, he's in Jerusalem, he's preaching, he's teaching, and he's, he's, he's laying in the re- uh, religious leaders, right? So I'll start in uh, 23, starting in verse 29. Jesus says to them, after 23 chapters of these confrontations, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. (laughs) Thus, you witness against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your own synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And Jesus began to explain to them this judgment. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies in the holy place of the temple, it will be defiled. When that happens, get up into the mountains. Get out of there. It's not going to be good. And so this generation received, as you know, from AD 70, received the judgment from God for not receiving uh, this Messiah. So he says, uh, he, he ends his, his description of this. He says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place, right? So you see this, this theme running throughout his interactions with this generation. I didn't want you to miss uh, Acts 2. There was one little line. I think your eyes skipped it, perhaps. Time, but yes. <laughs> well, what, what did you want to say about it? Anything uh, in particular? It is a big question, and I'd like to know what you're going to say. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> Point three there. Three, three. three on what page first, <laughs> of my notes? First, first page. You crucified him. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, have, I told you I have too many notes. Acts 2. Okay. Uh, the question is, who is held accountable for Jesus' crucifixion? Who's held accountable? Not who did it. I'm saying who's held accountable. Listen to this preaching. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst? As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Did you hear that? Who drove the nails? Roman Roman soldiers. Who's accountable for the crucifixion? Of the Jewish Messiah? The, right. The Jews of that generation, that particular generation, they said, his blood be on us and on our children. Crucify him. Right? And that's exactly what's going on in Acts 2, saying, you did this through the hands of sinful men. That's Acts 2. Um, okay. So, this is grim, Right? I, I hope you, you see how grim this is. I hope you see how severe this is. Um, and so what's really important to understand then, what we're saying is there are, as, the reason this is building off of covenant theology is because it's important to understand that there are not two people of God. One group that relates to God through animal sacrifices and then this whole other group that relates to him through faith in Jesus. And they're two covenant people, and God has two different covenant things running parallel. That's not what Scripture teaches us at all. Um, there are, there's one people of God. 
Um, and so as, as you maybe re- remember from Russell's sermon a few weeks ago, I think it was, he was talking about the Israel of God. It's a reference from Galatians 6. The Israel of God includes Gentiles. And listen to this. So wouldn't it be great if there was a Bible passage that specifically was talking to Gentiles and explained their relationship to Israel? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> listen up. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, Starting in verse 11, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember, you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, Jew Gentile. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Do you see that? That's what Gentiles are to be thinking, that we are, uh, we are, uh, have been brought into the commonwealth of Israel. We now are no longer strangers, the covenants of promise. We have hope and we're with God in the world. Praise the Lord, right? In Galatians 3, Paul said, talking about, uh, Abraham and Moses and how this unfolded. It's, it's a complicated description because Paul is exegeting. He's explaining the history of salvation. So he says the promises, this is in chapter three, verse 16. Paul says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring. Who is Christ, Paul says. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are heirs. Then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Do so you get that? See so how it's this expansive thing? And in the last 10 minutes, I want to look at this. Um, So I'm not sure what's in your hand out there, but we're going to skip a little bit for sake of time. So the question is, okay, all right, we can track with that, but what does that mean? Is God done with the people of Israel then? Is that it? That's the whole story? Um, Does Israel have the same status as Mexico? That's an interesting way to phrase it maybe to think about it. What is, what's going on here? What's the, what's the plan? Has God rejected his people? What's that a quote from? Romans, right? Romans 9 through 11, that's the fundamental question. Because Paul is saying it's not about physical descent. It's about faith in Jesus Christ that you are heirs of the covenant, right? And so the question, the crisis, Paul is a Jew and he's agonizing for his, his fellow kinsmen. And he, so the crisis is, is, is God cast away his people? Is that it? That's the whole story right there. And so um, what's fascinating to me, as I started to dig into this, to my surprise, uh, you would think, if you, if you weren't conversant with Reformed theology, you would think, oh, well, you follow covenant theology all the way through to its logical extension, right? Which is always a bad idea to just take something and run with it. If you did that, then that's it, because it's all east, west, north, south, everybody's in, and that's it. However, to my surprise, I learned that many, many, many widely held, uh, uh, Reformed theologians widely held that they saw in Romans 11 a future conversion of the nation of Israel. Did you know that? I don't know if you knew that. Um, So, it's fascinating to me, um, and let's. And so the the logic is, I'm going to quickly look at this passage, um, but, yep. So I just can you make a distinction? 
or is there a distinction because when you say nation of Israel, does that necessarily mean geographically as it exists right now? It means are you talking about the Jewish people. It means Israel as a people as a is the way people. Calvin would I'm talk just, about it. Yep. Yeah. So it's not a geographical question. <laughs> yep. So thank you. So uh, we'll look at Romans eleven in a second. Um, Here's a quick synopsis, because we have no time to go through all of it. Uh, do it, read it later, but uh, we'll look at one part of it. Here's the description, this, this fundamental question. There's a tree, an olive tree, and this tree represents the covenant people, as you'll see as we read through it. And, uh, you know, Paul is writing to the Romans, who are Gentiles, and he's saying, listen, Gentiles, don't be boasting there's a tree, and there are natural branches in the tree. Israel, as a people. And they were broken off and cast out. The natural branches were broken off because of unbelief. And you were wild olive uh, branches, and you, God, grafted in. Therefore, don't boast against the branches. Don't say, ah, oh, I'm so much better, right? Because the logic, what he says is because if God could cast them out, he can cast you out just as well, right? So it's setting up this whole story. And then he sets up, he says, uh, let's just read it, all right? So that's the framework. Uh, and if, if we're reading through this and you say, what? That's a really convoluted, convoluted way to do things. You're on the right track. Because listen, uh, starting in 17. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If, if you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. I'm just going to skip for time. Um, let's jump down to 24. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, the people of God, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. Ooh. Listen up, brothers, mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now listen, who's the Israel that's talked about? Here's, here's how it's described. Verse 28. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of the forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were Gentiles at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. So, there's a lot there. There's a lot of ink spilled on that. What I want to highlight is a few things from reformers. Not everybody understands this the same. There's a lot of ink spilled. There's a lot of room for disagreement. Let me I have a list of quotations here from the reformers, um, some of them. Uh, this is representative of a lot of it. Jonathan Edwards says, Nothing is more certainly foretold than this national conversion of the Jews is in the 11th chapter of Romans. Charles Hodge the second great event, which, according to the common faith of the church, is to precede the second advent of Christ, is the national conversion of the Jews. Uh, one more down here, John Murray, the very end of this quotation. 
In a word, it is the salvation of the mass of Israel that the apostle affirms. And you can go down through these quotations. The only one I will highlight before we leave today, um, the only other one in here is the Westminster Confession of Faith. Oh, sorry, the Westminster Larger Catechism. Question 191, which says, what do we pray for in the second petition of the Lord's Prayer? Thy kingdom come. So read the whole thing. It's, it's a whole paragraph. What are we praying for? When we pray, thy kingdom come, our catechism says, what are we praying for? It's a long list of stuff. We pray that the kingdom of sin and Satan may be destroyed, the gospel propagated throughout the world, the Jews called, and the fullness of the Gentiles brought in, and many other things as well. So it's fascinating to me, because I assumed, coming from dispensationalism, come into covenant theology and say, oh, okay, it's simple. Then you just run that logic out and there it is. But it was widely held among the reformers that, hey, haven't you read Romans 11? Haven't you seen the promises? It's too simplistic, right? So why are we talking about this? Why are we setting up this series with this kind of question? Two reasons. One, uh, if, if you have approached this class as a pan-millennialist, right, or you think maybe Reformed theology just spiritualizes everything and the kingdom of God is in my heart. And that's, maybe that's it. If that's your perspective, I hope that some of these things have surprised you, that that's not what the Reformed, that's not a fair representation of the Reformed um, consensus, I would say, about eschatological questions. Um, so if it surprised you, stay tuned, because I'm betting you're going to be surprised again and again. But secondly, and more importantly, it is essential that we understand that all the promises made to God's people are to those who are in Christ. It's absolutely essential. There's a basic principle of hermeneutics that we must understand the, the things harder to understand that Peter talks about. Paul is really hard to understand. The things that are obscure or not really clear, there's a basic principle that should be obvious. We have to understand those in light of the things that are really clear really, really clear. So when we read something in Revelation, we read this prophetic thing in Ezekiel, we have to say, and what has the Lord told us about this? How ought we to read this? And we go to what is clear. That principle doesn't answer every question for us, but it's the only sure foundation for a sound eschatology. It's the only way to think properly, i.e. scripturally, about what God has revealed. So where are we heading in these eight weeks? Um, We're going to be looking at many topics, Um, We're going to be looking at the second coming of Christ, uh, the resurrection of the dead, the eternal state for believers and unbelievers. Um, We're going to be talking about how all of scripture is eschatological, not just the end. We're going to be talking about the kingdom of God, which is the way I'm going to talk about the millennium question. Um, There's a lot of confusion about the millennium question that I think is really hard to wrap your head around unless you have it clarified what the actual questions are we're asking, right? Um, So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about ethics and eschatology, the relationship, that it's not just, you know, a numbers game for your curiosity, but it's to drive holy living. We're going to be talking about biblical symbolism. Is this just writing everything off? Aren't we supposed to take the Bible literally? Those kinds of questions about symbolism, how are we to understand it? Because as you know, scripture is full of symbolism, full of it. So how how do we read it? What are we we to do with it? And then we'll end this eight-part series talking specifically about the book of Revelation. So in all these discussions, we're going to be trying to present the the commonalities, if that's a word, I think it is, the commonalities within Reformed thought, not, if you've been in an eschatology class, a lot of times it's like, and here are the six views on this question, and then these four people say this about, and you know, it's like, okay, I I can't, I don't know what to do with that. So what my objective is, and Russell's objective, is to try to present kind of a reform consensus, sort of distilling all this and say, listen, this is the heartbeat of the reform faith thinking eschatologically. Um, So if you have any questions, specific questions that you would like addressed, feel free to email me or talk with me. And whether it's my week or Russell's, we'll see if we can fold it in or not. No promises. Um, But we're looking forward to going through this class to, to think together uh, about these these uh, important questions in God's word. So time's up. Uh, let's let's pray.
Our God and our Father, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you for your word that is true, and that you have given us uh, many precious promises in Jesus Christ. Lord, your wisdom is unsearchable. Your ways are inscrutable. And so, Lord, we uh, humbly uh, confess and lay our, our hands down to you, asking that you would give us your wisdom, that you would lead us, and that you would inspire us to godly living. Lord, may your church shine as light in the world, that all the nations would see and fear and glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Lord's Day. We pray that we would be able to rest and rejoice in it and that we would uh, commune in fellowship, uh, giving glory to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.